uh, turned upside down and cereal all over the floor. Oh no. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. For those of you that are online, welcome. Uh, we're glad to have you with us. Please give us a shout out in the comments and let us know that you are here with us this morning. Just some quick announcements this morning. Some of the nice things about winter is that it's a little slower sometimes, so it um, gives us a chance to breathe. But who wouldn't be hungry looking at bacon and eggs? So come hungry, get fed. Our next men's breakfast is February 3rd at 9 a.m. And then uh, following that, the week after, on the 10th, we will kick off season 19 of Orange Trap Racing. So it is coming a lot faster, and that just means I need to get on the computer and get all the forms and everything <laughs> ready to go for this year. And we also still need to have our uh, yearly meeting just to show up some of the rules. Fortunately, over the last couple of years, well, actually the last five or six years, we've only made minor tweaks to the rules. We finally, it took us, you know, like 15 years to get it right, <laughs> basically. So. We'll be having that on February 10th. Uh, registration starts at 9.30 in the morning with racing at 10. And then we're gonna jump ahead into March just because we wanna make sure that everybody has an opportunity to get signed up for this. But uh, instead of the men's breakfast on in March, we'll be going to the Iron Sharpens Iron Conference in Davenport. And that is from 8.30 to four. Uh, the speakers are Don Davis and Chris Harper. And it really is about building godly men and it's a great conference we've been going to it for a number of years so i'm just gonna hand this to the first person i see or the closest person to me and uh, if you're able to go go ahead and get signed up for that and we will have a great time going down there and fellowshipping and then worshiping with the other men there last year i think it was like 1200 men worshiping together so the, the strip of guys you see right here, that's just a portion of it. It was a packed house. There were standing no room only. yeah standing room only. Yep, no no empty seats. So it, it's not one of those where you know like for social media, let's take this picture just like this so we can make it look bigger <laughs> than it is. It was actually that big. So uh, we look forward to that. Um, that's going around. If you're online. Uh, Give us a shout out in the comments if you'd like to go and we'll get you added to that list. If money is an issue, please let Pastor Mark or I know because we do have scholarships available uh, for those who cannot afford it. It's that important. We want people or guys to be able to go to this. And then uh, last announcement is for those of you watching on, oh, I put this in, I put it in my notes. Our next movie is coming in March of this year. Um, have a little bit of fun with graphics and through the, our little fake marquee up on the, the screen there. So that'll be coming in March. More about that coming up soon. Uh, we have to finalize what movie it is and the day because we're, I don't think we're going to be able to race back from Davenport and do it on that first Saturday. So uh, we'll get that announced fairly soon. And then for and now, for those of you that are watching online, so that you can worship with us as well after uh, the online portion ends. And I am will be throwing the link to our playlist up in the comments for you. That being said, we have a beautiful day outside. It's much nicer than last week. Albeit it is a little chilly, but it's not at nearly as cold as it was last week. Last week, the temperatures with the snowstorm on top of it, we just felt it was too dangerous and did not want anyone putting their life at risk. Uh, so we po uh, canceled church last week. That is something we don't like to do, but we will do it uh, out of an abundance caution, which is what we did last week. So if that happens, uh, we've got the church chat if you're on that texting group. We also put it up on channel two, channel nine, our website, and all of our social media. So uh, we make sure that it gets out there. But today, the sun is out. Sounds like we have warmer weather coming this week. Mid to upper 30s are a possibility. Some of that snow melting away. I'm looking forward to that because on top of the two feet we have in our yard, we also have what we shovel on top of it. So it's like six. And I'm, I'm, I'm okay with shoveling. I don't mind, especially when I can whip out the snowblower. But 
it, we hit, winter came all at once for us, didn't it? Well, with that said, let's go ahead and get ready for God's word today. Uh, for those of you online, um, and those of you that don't know here, Pastor Mark is with us today. He had knee surgery uh, a little over a week ago, but yesterday as he went to get up, he twisted and hurt his knee. And so we are praying for relief from that pain and that the doctors can find out tomorrow what's causing the extra pain that he's experiencing. So let's calm ourselves and prepare to hear the message that God has given us this morning with our call to worship. Our verse this morning is from John 10, and verse 10. And this is out of the New International Version. It says, The thief come only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it in into the full. Now, this ties into our uh, message today, and that today we're going to talk about being distracted and what distracts us. And yes, the first thing a lot of people think of these, but there's more to it than just that. And we're going to talk about that here in a minute. But in, here, Jesus doesn't want us to merely have eternal life. He also wants us to experience life here fully. And to experience life here fully is far beyond what the world has for us. And in here, following a shepherd. So if we go back to Jesus' time, and we've got this great picture of Jesus up here holding a lamb like the shepherd. If we go back to that time, following a shepherd leads to blessing, and it leads to joy, and it leads to a growing experience of eternal life. And it allows him to rebu rebuke and reverse the enemy's attempts at blocking those blessings. We had a discussion on the way here today, and uh, Don was telling me about how he was just saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And it's catching on. And other people are starting to say, thank you, Jesus. When we see uh, our, these sports heroes, and we've talked about this in the past, we're idols. Right? We've got all these idols and these sports people that we idolize. A lot of these guys are coming out as Christian. Groups of guys are getting baptized on each team. When I think about some, the two names that jump out right away are C.J. Stroud and Brock Purdy. Both of them are very uh, out there about their faith. So was Kurt Warner. And Kurt Warner continues. The media actually is taking a little bit of a beating because they cut out part of an interview with CJ where he gave all glory to his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And they cut that section out of the interview. And so the world is trying to come in. The thief is trying to come in to steal and kill and destroy and remove God from our lives when that's just not happening. People are starting to come around. And so it will allow us to block, and, you know, keep them from blocking the blessings, the purpose and the spiritual fulfillment that God has for each of us in this life here. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to hear your message about how we are so easily distracted, but how we can Focus on you. And when we do that, those distractions go away. Those things are still a part of our lives, Father. But those distractions or the distraction that they bring into it, we are able to put aside because we have the peace that you give to us. Father, help us to hear your word today. Let us take this message. Let us go back out into the world and really use the things that you have taught taught us today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, a couple weeks ago before church, uh, Mark and I were talking with a couple of other people, and he made a statement that really hit me. And he said, life is not a video game. We cannot just hit the reset button. Well, that started me down a path on doing uh, a message about resets. And then as I'm going at it, God changed the message. And 
I didn't have a title for it. I just knew the basis of what he was asking. And then uh, I sat down to start writing. And Diane goes, how, how, how did it go? Because I was only well, sitting at the computer for maybe an hour, hour and a half. I said, well, I've got about three-fourths of it done. And she just looked at me like, what? You usually take hours. <laughs> no, just that done. And when I finished it, it was another hour. I mean, this just flowed. And then it was like, OK, I need a graphic. Well, life is busy, so let's put a blurry, you know, because we don't know if these people want the picture out there. But let's put a blurry picture up there, and hopefully nobody's too distracted by the fact that the A is upside down. It, it just fit into the fact that we get distracted, and what are the things that distract us? I can get distracted by, oh, there's a piece of paper on the floor. Let's pick it up and throw it away. But what are the things that distract us? And, and what, what are all the things in our lives that get in the way of that relationship with God? There's a lot. And as I was writing this, because this was for last week, and then we got distracted. On Monday, after you know, the last message that we had from Pastor Mark, <laughs> we get 13 plus inches of snow. Followed up by three, and then three, and now I think there's like about two feet of snow on our side of town. It, it varies depending on what side of town you are, and then how high you piled it when you were shoveling, as I alluded to earlier. I love the snow. Diane can attest to that. I go out and I shovel and I blow snow for the neighbors. Because, you know, when we bought the snow blower, I said, we're not spending this much money and just using it on ourselves. And so that's what we do. I used to be an avid skier. I loved downhill skiing. I had skis and it's been, well, Diane and I have been together 25 years, so it's been 27 years ago was the last time I went. I'm going down, and this is up by St. Paul, Minnesota, and I'm going down a, what they call up there a black diamond. Nothing like the black diamonds that are out in Colorado or what have you, but I'm going down it, and it's pretty much sheer ice. And my, granted my boots and my skis were probably a little too old because one of my boots exploded and the ski went pew. I did find the ski, and I went to get new boots, and they said, oh no, you can't because your bindings are illegal now. So you'll need to replace those. Well, the boots were gonna be 500 and the bindings were gonna be a, few, a little bit more. I said, yeah, no, I'm done. But I love to ski. Now I won't do it because I'm just getting a little too old for that. But I love going out now, because I can't ski, going out and helping dig out. In fact, our neighbors moved here a few months ago and their house is for sale and the snow was so deep and I it was like, dang, I'm sure Diane's watching me going, what is he doing? I went over the, I went over and blew out the driveway because in my mind, I'm thinking, what if something happens? They're not there. If that house catches on fire, emergency vehicles can't get to it. So as I'm doing things, I got distracted. And I also love taking care of Diane. And part of that is going out and shoveling the driveway and cleaning up the carper. And yeah, I've been getting up at 3.30 or 4 in the morning to do that because she has to be to work at 5. What I wasn't ready for was the additional distractions. So as I'm going through the week, the additional distractions distracting me from working on the message were I was too tired from getting up so early. So by the time the night time came around, I was like, mm, I'll work on it tomorrow. But here's the thing, we're in great company. The Bible is absolutely chock full of stories of God's people getting distracted by one thing or another. And as I was preparing, I ran across this story. Now, there's no way to prove whether or not this is a true story or not, so just take it as for what it is, the message that comes from it. But Satan called a worldwide convention of demons. 
in his opening address, he said, we can't keep Christians from going to church. We can't keep them from reading their Bibles and knowing the truth. We can't even keep them from forming an intimate relationship with their Savior. Once they gain that connection with Jesus, our power over them is broken. So let them go to their churches. Let them have their covered dish dinners, but steal their time so they don't have time to develop a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is what I want you to do, said the devil. Distract them from gaining hold of their Savior and maintaining that vital connection throughout their day. How shall we do this? The demons responded. Keep them busy in the non-essentials of life and invent innumerable schemes to occupy their minds. I'm thinking Grinch at that point. Tempt them to spend, 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 and borrow, borrow, borrow. Persuade the wives to go to work for long hours and the husbands to work six to seven days each week, 10 to 12 hours a day, so that they can afford their empty lifestyles. Keep them from spending time with their children. As their families fragment, soon their homes will offer no escape from the pressures of work. Overstimulate their minds so that they cannot hear that still, small voice. Entice them to play the radio or cassette player whenever they drive, to keep the TV, VCR, DVD players, CDs, and their PCs going constantly in their home and see to it that every store and restaurant in the world plays non-biblical music constantly. This will jam their minds and break that union with Christ. Fill the coffee tables with magazines and newspapers. Pound their minds with the news 24 hours a day. Invade their driving moments with billboards. Flood their mailboxes with junk mail, mail order catalogs, sweepstakes, and every kind of newsletter and promotional offering, free products, services, and false hopes. Keep skinny, beautiful models on the magazines and TVs so their husbands will believe that outward beauty is what's important, and they'll become dissatisfied with their wives. Keep the wives too tired to love their husbands at night. Give them headaches, too. If they don't give their husbands the love they need, then they will begin to look elsewhere. That will fragment their families quickly. Give them Santa Claus to distract them from teaching their children the real meaning of Christmas. Give them an Easter bunny so they won't talk about his resurrection and power over sin and death. Even in their recreation, let them be excessive. Have them return from their recreation exhausted. Keep them too busy to go out in nature and reflect on God's creation. Send them to amusement parks, sporting events, plays, concerts, and movies instead. Keep them busy, busy, busy. And when they meet for spiritual fellowship, involve them in gossip and small talk so that they will leave with troubled consciences. Crowd their lives with so many good causes, they have no time to seek power from Jesus. Soon they will be working in their own strength and sacrificing their health and family for the good of the cause. It will work. It will work. It was quite a plan. The demons went eagerly to their assignments, causing Christians everywhere to get busier and more rushed, going here and there, having little time for their God or their families, having no time to tell others about the power of Jesus to change lives. This has been written a few years ago, hence the talk about VCRs in there. But what do you think? Has Satan and his demons been successful? We get caught up in so many of those things. Our phones. I'm guilty. In fact, I've got it with me. I should be back there. The TV. I mean, there's not just... When we grew up, there was what? ABC, CBS, NBC, PBS. And at the end of the day, what did we hear? A national anthem, followed by... <laughs> the, the little colored screen, right? Computers. Access to anything and everything you could ever imagine on the internet. Kids' activities. 
if your child is not involved in a club sport, they will not play high school sports. They get pushed out. What we need to do is stop. We get distracted. And there are so many stories of being distracted. These are the ones that just kind of pop in as I'm typing away. Luke 10, 38 through 42, when Jesus visits Mary and Martha, what do we read? We hear this. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, what you don't hear in this portion of the scripture and the verses that I just read is that both Mary and Martha loved Jesus. It wasn't that one did and one did. They both did. And they both loved to serve him. How did Mary serve him? By sitting at his feet listening to him speak. Martha got concerned with the meal. This big dinner. Now, who's that family come over and you are consumed with? Is the house clean? Are they going to like what do I make? Is it going to get burned? Are we going to have to order feet? You know, all these things. And you're totally so wrapped up in it, you forget about enjoying the fact that family's coming. That's what happened with Martha. She was distracted by the meal and the preparation, and she forgot who was already there. It begs the question, are we so distracted by the things in life that we are, and the things that we are doing in life that we don't spend time with Jesus? In Martha's serving, and she was serving, she was preparing a big meal but she became self-serving. Not serving Christ, but serving herself. What she was doing was plain and simple, busy work. Tell her to come and help me. You can even hear the attitude in her voice. Martha was forgetting the importance of spending time with the Messiah. And Jesus was telling Martha, not to sweat the small stuff. There's a book out there. Don't sweat the small stuff. And in little writing underneath it says, because it's all small stuff. And it is. In the grand scheme of things, it is irrelevant. Jesus wanted her to realize what was important and what was not. All that small stuff can have a huge influence over you. Getting all worked up about things that when you look at it, there's really no, really no lasting impact. She made this big, probably wonderfully tasting meal. Who's going to remember it in a week? But who's going to remember, like Mary, sitting at Jesus' feet and what he taught her? Longer lasting. Which tells us that there are a lot of small things that can still have a big impact saying short prayers throughout the day, something we talked about on the way here this morning. Spending a few minutes reading a passage from the Bible. Maybe you, the alarm went off, you didn't hear it, now you're scrambling. Stop, open your Bible to where you last were at and read a couple of verses, say a short prayer. Take time for God. Other things that we can do is Treating others with kindness. Something that you can ask yourself is, is it significant to my relationship with God? What I'm doing 
what I'm saying, what I'm about to do, is it significant to that relationship? In case there's someone out there wondering whether it is significant or not, ask God. Go to God with it. If the answer is yes, be intentional about it and focus on it. If the answer is no, simply let it go. The, and I was I was talking to a couple of guys this morning, and one the next message that I started preparing, which I'm, it just popped in right in the middle of this, when God doesn't answer right away. What does that look like? How does that go? But, and, and so now I don't have to worry about my next message. He's already given me the bones to it, so to speak. But in that, I don't have to worry. And that's what Jesus is teaching us in Matthew 6 when he's preaching in the Sermon on the Mount. This is 25 through 34. So that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life. All that worry that we have in our lives, what does it do? It raises your blood pressure? Steals your life. It steals your life. And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. This morning, I had gotten up and I got my cup of coffee and I opened the back curtain to our sliding door and I looked out from this. When I look out, I look to the south and the southeast usually. And the painting, it was like this incredibly beautiful watercolor sunrise painting that God. And, and in that moment, I'm by myself, Diane's still asleep, the room is dark, and I'm thinking, God painted that for me. <coughs> And then he reminded me, yes, he painted it for me, but he painted it for everyone else, too. But how wonderful is that, that he can create something so beautiful? Matthew goes on and says, And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Worry is a distraction. It can cause a lot of harm to your health, to your productivity, your relationships, and how you treat others, and many, many more. Yesterday was one of those Saturdays where we had nothing on the calendar. So what are we going to do? And as we're thinking about what to do, I went in the back room, because here a couple of years ago, talk about distractions. A couple of years ago, we paint, well, Diane painted the house because she was off work after being laid off. and whatnot. She painted all the walls, so everything came off the walls. The walls are still a little okay a lot there. So I brought out two tubs of things that used to be on the walls. I sat them in the living room and I started putting them out and I said, what do you want to do with it? What do you want to do with it? Where do you want to put it? And we got, there's a small group of them that I took, set them on the kitchen floor, took pictures. We're going to send them to the kids and say, do you want these? If they don't, then we'll give them away. 
because they were beautiful. But we went and hung things on the wall, and that was exciting. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, and then we got uh, and not distracted, but it, it put us onto what we we've got these huge frame, like not quite as big as this TV frames, but big that hold collages of pictures. And one of them has pictures in it. It's never been hung up. Now those pictures are old, and they need new pictures. So now we've got another project. Find pictures, print them, and put them in there, get them up on the wall and off the floor and in yeah. the back room. Get rid of those distractions. But in addition to productivity and health, relationships. We've heard that in our little story this morning, kind of can get in the way of relationships, and it's how we treat others. Has anybody noticed that how we treat others has gone downhill over the last few, six or four years? It also can reduce your ability to trust God. I've heard people say, I'm not worried, I'm concerned. Now you're worried. Concern, though, is if, if it wasn't, if it's actual concern and not worry, you would be prompted into action and doing something. Worry distracts and immobilizes you. And that's what we're talking about today. What are the things that keep you from doing something? Verse 33 said, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Not want, need. We have to put God first instead of letting all the other things in life distract us and come ahead. If you let them get in the way, those things become the most important things in your life and not God. Paul gives us a good place to start. Let's look at Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. When I read this, I not only heard Paul say that we should not worry about anything, I also heard him say, don't be distracted by anything. Pray about everything. In other words, go to God about literally everything this is what i love about our our church text yesterday a lot of things happened you know we had um one somebody had a good friend die and then we found out someone else had a good friend die and then we found out about, about mark's fall and then we found out about the young man who had the accidents while snowboarding And in that moment, even though we may not respond right away, each person has the ability and the opportunity to stop and say a short prayer. It could be as simple as, Lord be with Regis's family. Lord be with Pastor Larry's family. Lord be with Mark. Lord be with the young man who was in very quick, but we come together. What do the scriptures tell us? When we come together and pray together, where two or more are gathered, he is there. He hears those prayers, and prayers are answered. In the message a couple of weeks ago, Mark spoke about overcoming adversity, and he asked, why don't we go to God first? Well, here's the thing. A lot of people are like me. I'm a fix-it person. I want to fix it. Now, Dan just says, All right, you just listen. You don't need to fix it. I would just listen. But how many people can hear a little kid go, I can do it myself. <laughs> and I saw this and I said, I told you I can do it myself. <laughs> this is just a picture. There's videos out there of little kids saying, I can do it myself. But then there's the parents. We look like this. Please pray for me while my toddler is going through that. I can do it myself phase in life. 
And then I got to thinking, Todd there, how about middle schooler, tween, teen, adult? Yeah. I'm doing that now. The more we worry, the more we are distracted, the less time we spend with God. When we start to worry over the distractions in our lives, we need to take that as a call to action, a call to prayer. And the more time that we spend with God, the more time we pray, the less we will worry and the less we'll be distracted. This is not a time for general prayer. We think the world a better place. This is a time where we need to be specific. We need to be like David is in the Psalms. When David is praying in the Psalms, when he is talking to God in the Psalms, he's not being generous. Oh, he's not just asking for, you know, sunshine and rainbows. He's getting real. He's getting raw with God. And yeah, I know, prayer can be just very frustrating. I've heard it put that prayer can be like putting your money in a vending machine, selecting what you want. You push the buttons, and sometimes you have to put two. You know, A and 32 or whatever that would be. You have to push the buttons and then nothing happens. It just stays there. This is the mistake that we make with God in prayer. We pray to God and might not, we may have skipped that general part and went straight to the specific and then out of the corner of our eye we're watching waiting for it to happen. It doesn't happen. It's just like the world that we live in. Everything is instant. People are asking Google. People are asking Alexa. People are asking Siri. And what happens? You're inundated with an instant response. That's the world we live in. And when we don't get that instant response, what happens? We get frustrated. Those of us that are old enough to remember dial-up, that was frustration. <laughs> Start your dialogue, go make dinner, eat your dinner, clean up for me dinner, go check on it again, still not go and go watch a TV show. It took time. And what we have to realize is that God's answers come in three different pieces. It's either yes, no, or not right now. And it may be that while you're waiting, that God is setting something up for you. Or he's sending someone to you. So that takes me back to the vending machine. You're still sitting there going, where's my chips? Somebody comes up, puts in their money, they push the buttons, and all of a sudden both pieces come down. God does things on purpose for a purpose. He sometimes has to send someone into your life to help you along the way. We have to accept that help. And regardless of the outcome of our prayer, we need to avoid being distracted by what we are praying for. We're praying for the cancer to go away. We're praying for the healing of a after a surgery. We're praying for start filling in the blank because there's thousands of things we can put in there. What we need to be doing is focusing on and being thankful for the one to whom we are praying. Thankful that we can actually go to God, someone, and pray for these things. Because if God didn't exist, which a lot of people think, and they're wrong. Let's put that up there. They have, there's no hope. There's no one they can go to. When we do this, we're demonstrating our faith in God, and we will have a better understanding of his peace. So even in the midst of the worst thing in your life, the worst thing in your friend's life, your family's wife, however, you can look at it and have peace. And as we go through this process and we spend that more and more time with God, we receive more and more understanding 
and the feeling of that peace. Now, as peace is very different than what the world wants us to think peace is, or what the world considers peace is. In, in, the, in the New Living Translation, verse 7 says that it exceeds anything we can understand. Other versions say transcends or surpasses our understanding. This is a peace that is not found through the power of positive thinking. We can't just think happy thoughts and it's going to, you know, we're going to have that peace. It's, it is not the absence of death. It's not the absence of destruction or illness or war and on and on goes that list. It's not about feeling good or, or not feeling anxious or being anxious about things. All those things are just mere distractions. God's peace comes from knowing that in the midst of those things that he is in control. Allow God's peace to guard your hearts and know that those distractions are only temporary. Just like anything else in our life, it's temporary you will experience calm in the midst of chaos. In the midst of all those distractions, you will experience God's peace and be calm. This reminds me of the story where Jesus calms the storm. So if we think about it, Jesus and the disciples were heading across the lake when they encountered a storm. What was Jesus doing? Jesus is in the back of the boat, taking a nap. He was asleep. I get that. When I was a kid, I could sit on the bus and ride anywhere, and whether it was to and from home, to an event, what have you, and I could sleep. And quite literally nothing woke me up. We were going to a, uh, it was a jazz band contest. It was one of the first in the state at the time. And on the way there, well, I woke up. When we got there, when the bus stopped, I woke up. That woke me up. Both my shoelaces were tied to the bench posts. I don't remember the color of the fingernail polish. And I remember racing to the bathroom with my face covered so that I could get the makeup off. They got me all dressed up. Didn't wake me. So I can understand how Jesus could be sleeping through this storm. The disciples, though, they were distracted by, and they were worried by this storm because it, what, it was battering the boat. And the waves, they weren't just battering the boat. The water was coming up over and in and starting to fill the boat. And finally, after all this worry and being distracted by all that was going on, they went back and they woke Jesus up. And in verse 38 of Mark 4, they say this, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? They took their specific worry to him, finally. They were real, and their emotions were definitely wrong. What did they to God before they got distracted? Jesus then, in verse 39 and 40, says this, when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence! Be still! Suddenly the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? He's not wrong. Why were they afraid? They had the Messiah in the boat with them. They had witnessed all of these miracles to date. They had seen him heal. They had heard him teach. Well, that's an easy one to reflect on because we can understand it because we do it ourselves. We know it too well. In the moment, we are easily distracted by whatever our current storm is. It is so easy to forget what was said or what happened yesterday and the days, weeks, months, and years before. It's easy to forget. What we forget is what Jesus said just before they crossed the lake. If we go back to the beginning of this story, Jesus says this, let's cross to the other side of the lake. He just told them it was going to be okay. 
for it is in God's word, in his presence, through time and prayer that we can come, or that we can escape from the distractions we all face each and every day. And we can know that it's going to be okay. There's a saying that says, no God, capital N-O, no peace. But no God, K-N-O-W, then you can know peace. So, what's your plan for the rest of the day? Sidetrack, we'll probably get home and go, where do you want to eat? I don't know where you want. Decisions, distractions. But let's go back. Remember our story from earlier about Satan's demon convention? Their plan was to distract the Christians kill and destroy. Jesus came to save us from that. He came to give us full life now and into eternity. So let's go back to John chapter 10, but let's back up to verse 7. Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. When we spend time with God, we hear his voice. The sheep know the voice of their shepherd. When we verse when we take time to pray and read God's word, we hear his voice. We are able to, above all the distractions, still hear that as the demon, as Satan was saying, so they don't hear that still small voice. That's why it's so important to spend time with God throughout the course of the day. You may start the day and Mark and I talk about this all the time we start we open up we begin our day in the Bible and scripture we do our, our daily reading again not for a check mark but for the relationship that we have with God and that grows and it grows and it grows and then the thief will not be able to come and kill and destroy and we will have life to its fullness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that through your word we can find peace amidst all the distractions of life. It is in your word that we can find a way to navigate through whatever it is that we are going through. Lord, it is my prayer this morning that we would be able to recognize the distractions that Satan has placed in our way, drawing our attention away from you, God. Lord God, I ask that you would rebuke Satan's efforts to distract us. When our minds wander into the vast wilderness that the world is offering over you, that you would be our compass, guiding and directing us back to you. Transform us, Lord, so that we can know and experience your peace now and into eternity. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. would have been so easy that night for Jesus to have gotten distracted. If he was just mere human and not fully God, he would have been distracted by what he knew was about to happen. But instead he came and he got in front of his disciples. He took off his robe and he put on an apron. He got a basin of water and he washed the disciples. He served God by doing that. He kept from being distracted. And then later in the meal, knowing who was going to take the bread from the bowl and then leave and betray him, he broke the bread saying, this is the, my body broken for you. Take and eat.
Later in the meal, he took the cup, and after blessing it, said, this is the blood of the new covenant. My blood shed for your sins. And in saying your, he didn't just mean the disciples sitting in front of him, the people that were in the room with him. He meant for all, whether they accept him or not. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Father God, we just thank you for what this meal represents. We thank you for your word, Father, for the scriptures. Because it's throughout the scriptures that we are given examples of how not to be destructive. We're shown how we can have your peace. Thank you, Father, that you give these things to us. In Jesus' mighty name. to add to this this morning we had quite a few yesterday so I'll be commenting on those and praying for those people okay father God we come to you today with open minds and hearts to receive your teachings so that we can be a vessel and a light that shines in the darkness to tell others your great and awesome power and love for all humanity you did not die on the cross and arise from the dead to save just one, but to save all who will choose to believe in you. In your word, you command us to teach others and to tell our children so that they will tell their children. In Psalm 78, 1, 4 through 7, O oh my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonder he has done, so that the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God. And we praise you, God, and thank you for your words of wisdom. Father God, help us to teach our children and grandchildren your decrees, so they understand who you are and the great love you have for them, if they do not forget your words so that they will be blessed among the people of this earth. Help us as parents and teachers to learn your statutes and keep your decrees to build others up in your word and deeds. You are such a great God, and we thank you and praise you for your unconditional love for us. Father God, we lift up Mark to you today. We thank you for his life. We praise you that his knee surgery went well, and we ask for quick healing of his knee. And we, we ask for wisdom for the doctors tomorrow as he goes to the doctor to find out why he's having extra pain. And Father God, I just lift them all up to you and um, let your presence be with them. Let the Holy Spirit reign in that room so that they understand what is going on. And we pray that the pain will be relieved. Father God, we lift up the Bosenbergs and ask, for, ask you for courage, wisdom, and healing as they face a new trial in their lives. Please comfort them with your word as only you can. And Lord, we lift up the homeless to you today. I thank you for their lives. I ask that all the shelters are open to receive them and keep them from the elements. I ask for peace among them as they are all together for the duration of this winter. I ask that you will give them the wisdom and courage they need to help them out of their situations. Give them jobs to sustain them through this life. Open doors for them, O oh God. Father God, there is a young man named Lucas who has had two emergency surgeries due to a snowboarding accident. We thank you for Lucas's life, and we ask that you will supersede in his healing. Please heal his body correctly so that he will not be paralyzed, Father God. We trust you with his life, Lord Jesus, and we thank you for that blessing. 
Father, we've lost many friends and families this week as you called them home. I pray for all who have lost loved ones this week that God give you the peace that passes all understanding and the knowledge that he is a great God who gives mercy and grace to all those who love him. And Father God, we thank you that you have blessed America all these years. We ask that your hand be upon us as we come into another election year. Please lift up the person that will govern America with your laws and decrees. Give us a leader that will defend America and lead our nation as you want them to. Do not let this beautiful land be shredded by the evil one. Bring our nation back to the knowledge of you. Please do not forsake us or leave us, Lord Jesus. Help America to wake up and acknowledge you as our God so that you will never leave us or forsake us. You are a great and powerful God, and whoever's nation acknowledges you will be blessed. As it states in Psalm 79, 8 and 9, Do not hold against us the sins of the fathers. May your mercy come quickly to meet us, for we are in desperate need, Lord Jesus. Help us, O God, our Savior, for the glory of your name, Deliver us and forgive us our sins for your name's sake. And we thank you, God, and praise you, Holy Spirit. We praise you in Jesus' precious and mighty name. Amen. Thank you. Example of Satan wanting to distract us. I'm not sure how far into the light feed we got, but... It's shut down. Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh, you think of this. Oh, well. Hopefully it recorded. It, it, the other uh, recording is still recording. So we'll be able to get that up there this afternoon. But it, God just wanted, God will win in this. Satan wanted to distract. He didn't want this message heard. And so, you know, th those are distractions. There was a time where that distraction would have been, um, yeah, I would have probably reacted, reacted so well. <laughs> I would have been really upset. I would have been back there while you were praying. It was like, it stopped, I, I got back up, we're fine. And even if not, God's word will still get out there. The message will still get out to the people, no matter how hard Satan tries. And we just have to remember Psalm 4610 says, Be still and know that I am God. That's what was running through my mind. So as we prepare to end this part of our service, just think about those things that you heard today knowing God's peace regardless of whatever distractions come our way. Father, thank you that in the midst of everything that we can stop and we can hear your still small voice. Satan will not win. We already know. Just as Jesus told the disciples that they would cross to the other side Telling them that everything would be okay. So when we read your book, your scriptures, the Bible, we know when we get to the end, everything, regardless of anything that happened before, all the distractions in our lives, at the very end, you win. Thank you, God, for that assurance. Thank you that we can get our hope and peace from that, Father. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.